Anyway, so December 3rd is when I launched it. First day, make four grand. The next day, make eight grand. The third day, make 11 grand. The fourth day, make 13 grand. <laughs> and then I remember sitting in my um, cal calculus classroom doing our exam. December 6th is when you do your final exam. I looked into my phone. I was like, okay, this is the first day I did $13,000. I'm just going to quit. So I literally dropped the pen and walked out. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I don't really. Do I really All right, thirteen thousand. That's that was the number I was waiting for. I'm leaving. A day? That that yeah, was enough for me. Today we're here with Jason Wong, CEO, entrepreneur of Doe Lashes, and a bunch of other ventures that we'll get into as well. Uh, but we're here today, and we're gonna go under the influence. Jason, Cheers. thanks for being here. Love you. So, well, I know Jason because of the Nectar guys, but I was following him on Twitter before I even met him. And then I met him one day. I was like, yo, thank you, bro. Like, I've learned <laughs> a lot from following you on Twitter. What made you want to start, like, D2C, like, content on Twitter? I just felt like there was a lot of misinformation and the gurus out there who were mm -hmm. really just trying to make a quick buck off people learning. So I'm like, nah, let, let, let me see if I can change that. So I started talking to folks like Shopify. It's like the eBay for DDC companies. Um, and I started teaching there. I started teaching at schools. And then I'm like, okay, let's, let's make this super accessible, Twitter, um, where most people are on there. Um, and we found that a lot of people love learning micro content, small bits and pieces rather than taking like full on classes. I would say even before, well, let, let's get the backstory. Let's start from the beginning because it's like pretty crazy of like where you've come from. So you've come straight from the mud. Give us like where walk us through your journey up until the point where you had your first business like where were you from yeah when did you come to i'm gonna give you guys like a quick run through because i do this a lot yeah. i was born in hong kong um 1997 and then in 05 my mom and i came here to america so the first place i landed was in new york uh lower east side of new york um a lot of my family are in the restaurant business so takeout restaurants anytime you see those like takeout restaurants it's probably one of my extended family members <laughs> like um and oh and what happened was that I started being in the restaurant business and learning about how to operate these companies and like the front end and the back end, like as a nine year old, um, learning how to cook, learning how to manage the business, doing the cashier stuff. And then that was really like what really inspired me to start doing my own business when I was 14. I started importing stuff from China to sell on eBay, um, selling sunglasses, um, shoes, phone chargers, phone cases. When iPhone 5 came out, I was making bank off phone cases uh, because that's when you can do those like uh, phone, phone case charging case. Mm. Um, so that's really like what kicked off the first business. And so like where were you living at that time? Oh, that when I first started, that was in Florida um, because my mom and I didn't really have a lot of money to start. We were just living with our relatives. So I moved around a lot. So I went from New York, Indiana, New Jersey, Connecticut, um, and then to California, Oklahoma, Florida. And then my mom got remarried and then I moved to Canada with her. Crazy. <laughs> Damn. You're, you're going to have to take two back to back, yeah. by the way. Mm. How, how many states was that? All in all, I didn't even start counting the other ones. I think I'll start in like 10 states. Jeez. Yeah. Like, you're very adverse in the internet. Is that why? Yeah. yeah what was that like moving around and, and like, ha making friends that... Yeah. yeah, how I got started on the internet actually came in while I was in the, bus in the restaurant business. I'm not in the restaurant business, but, like, being in my family's restaurant business. Because I was really young, I was on the computer, and then when a the customer would come in, I'll go out and, like, take their order. You ever seen, like, those funny memes of, like, kids <laughs> in Chinese restaurants, like, doing a homework? That was yeah. me, but with a laptop. So, like, starting when I was 10 years old, I was on the internet, reading through forums. Um, they're like, are you age, like 13 years old? I'm like, of course not. So go in there, start reading all the forums, reading about how people do certain things. And Which then, forums? Which forums? Like, like, where do you even start? For me, it was like Neopets, right? Like, what uh, was Club Penguin. <laughs> uh, no, that's not a forum, but like I started off Club Penguin. Club Penguin. And I was sort of like, okay, you can actually meet people. Like, that was what sparked the idea of like, you can meet people in there. Mm -hmm. um, hold on, let me do a quick one. And I'm like, okay, let's go on forums. So I start using a site like Gaia Online. Like you can do avatars on there. Start reading like um, people's analysis of social issues, politics. As a as an 11 year old, that was like a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. But 
content wise aside, what really drove me to start in e-commerce was knowing how many people there are at. Growing up, it was just whatever was within my proximity, but being online, seeing that amount of people there, it made me realize that whatever I do right now, I can actually show it to a lot more people if I just take advantage of it. So that's what sparked the light bulb in my head. So what was the first e like how, first of all, people need to realize how young you are. So how old were you when you first launched? Let's talk through the first successful e business, Meme Bible, and talk that your age and all that. It was actually before Meme Bible. Oh, I wow. just I just stopped oh, the talking phone about cases and stuff. Not, uh, I thought phone cases was, was phone cases was just like the start. Uh -huh. But what went viral was when I made the sweater of Drake dancing to Hotline Bling. Mm. When he was dancing in all those colorful rooms, him dancing, I made a, a Christmas sweater out of it, and it went viral. That was when I made like my first hundred grand. I was like, holy crap, that's a lot of money I can make. How old were you when you made that hundred grand? Um, seventeen. Damn. Yeah. So you're 17 years old with $100,000 sitting in your account. After, uh, after expenses, not that much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, and then like, I started doing like, politics stuff. So when Bernie Sanders came out of this campaign, I photoshopped a picture of him holding a cat with like galaxy backgrounds. And that also went viral because anything presidential was going viral at the time. So I just started doing like, these stuff in the apparel space and then switched over to starting Meme Bible. Wait, so how, did you, how are you advertising these Tumblr. products? Tumblr. Okay. Purely Tumblr. Yeah. Well, tell us about Tumblr. So what age did you get into Tumblr, and how did it grow? It was freshman year of high school. My friend was talking to me outside of, um, outside of class. He was like, yo, you can actually like make quick money if you start a Tumblr account and just get people to click on your ads. Back then, it was very easy for you to make money on a PPC, pay-per-click basis, where you just get your friends to click each other's ads. Like, Google wasn't strict about that back then, so he's like, yo, click my ads, so click your ads. And we just do that back and forth, and we make like 100 bucks a day. Yeah. How many clicks, though? How long were you sitting there? Oh, at that, that took game? a while. Like, like you were like, sitting there for hours we're clicking. We're grinding. Holy like, shit. We're like using different IPs. We're like using different browsers just so like they don't catch on to it. And then we're also doing like affiliate offers. Like um, people are like, oh, if you get someone to sign up and give us their email, we'll pay you four bucks mm. for an email. I'm like, oh, crap, let's do that. I just need to get like 100 to make, you know, however much, right? Um, and, and that's really how I got started on Tumblr was knowing that there was money to be made. But then over time, I realized that a lot of people on Tumblr didn't really understand scale. A lot of people were doing it purely out of passion. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you, hey, I actually really like posting on Tumblr. Um, so I started acquiring these blogs because they didn't really know how much money it's worth. So I started buying them out. So I, and then it grew to like 32 million people within Jeez. my network. And so, but, but so you're buying them out, though. What are these pages? And then how are you? They're, they're on board creating content for that. Like, talk us through how that works. There's a number of blogs in, spanning in, like, photography, cars, memes, beauty, mm -hmm. and all that niche. So I start buying them up and hiring, like, a centralized team to run these, com like, run these blogs like a business. Because everyone's on Tumblr like, oh, I'm just like, a depressed teenager posting yep. pictures. But I'm like, nah, there's money. There's money to be made. So I start working with, like, larger retailers. Like, Shein, one of the largest brands right now, came from like, us. We were the first company or first team to promote them. Um, like, artists like Lana Del Rey really got their start on Tumblr. Aesop Rocky got their music spread through Tumblr. So there's a lot of people that really came from Tumblr that no one knows about. Okay, so, so Sheen comes to you and they go, hey, we got this new pair of pants, and you're figuring out different, like, here's how it could fit on a car page, here's how it could fit, and how do you again? Um, I was like 15, 16. And you built like a team of people to manage a blog. Yeah. So, I, like, well, I know he's way too old to understand what Tumblr was, but I used to have a Tumblr. So for all the dinosaurs like my man here, can you explain like what Tumblr was like? Um, in an official way, it's a microblogging site, but in an easier to understand term, it's a place that you can post multimedia stuff. So songs, pictures, videos, text, um, and people will share it and they call it reblogging. And you can like it just like how you like it for anything else. Um, but if it really functions just the same as any other social media platform. I agree. It yeah. was very unique because one, it was super moody, right? Like yeah. e everyone on there was depressed. <laughs> I, I always thought of it was like a, it was like a mood board for like teenagers, like, like a Pinterest public mood. Yeah, Pinterest. exactly. Pinterest yeah. is just like a more like, I guess, I don't know, business friendly version. But yeah, see, that's the thing that a lot of businesses don't get is that they think a platform is X and they let the assumption ride. So, like, when TikTok first came out, they're like, ah, it's a bunch of 13-year-olds dancing and lip-syncing and there's no money in it. 
and I saw the opportunity. I'm like, you know what? As long as there's eyeballs, and as long as there's a way for us to get eyeballs, there's money to be made. So we hop onto TikTok really early on. And well, how we, early? Two years ago. Damn. 2019? Whoa. For a brand, really early. Super early. Super brand. As dope? I mean, yeah. Okay. That was also kind of right when they became TikTok. Exactly. But but everyone was like dismissing it. Wait, so were not wait, touching wait, why it. did you dismiss why did you dismiss musically and not tick like what about them changing to TikTok? Because it still felt like musically at that shift. So what made you think like all of a sudden? It's not that I, I like dismissed this. musically. I just didn't have the company to put on musically at the time. Like Doe really started two years ago. Oh. So our, our our launch plan was TikTok when everyone was going to Facebook. Um, but the same thing for Tumblr is like as long as there's eyeballs, I don't care if it's a bunch of moody teenagers posting stuff. As long as there's eyeballs, there's money to be made. You just need to know how to capitalize on it. And like this, this the the pay per click advertising that was like Google, like uh, AdSense, or it was like affiliate marketing. It was AdSense and affiliate marketing. Okay, we, we did a mixture of both. That's fucking crazy. And the thing is, like, once you start acquiring these properties, blogs, uh -huh. you start cross promoting with each other. So we start growing internally, mm. and you start selling ad spots to companies, four hundred bucks a post, five hundred bucks a post, or pay per performance. Um, there's a lot of ways for us to make money. At one point, we actually made. Uh, more money than Tumblr is, itself. You're I'm, lying. Yeah. So it was, wait. So just real quick, <laughs> if you could share numbers, how much were you making on Tumblr? Tumblr? Um, and at, how come you're not retired, like with a private jet? Like where where did it all go? How did how did it all break down? Reckless spending. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean we had a team. We had a lot of people to pay out to. Um, at my peak as a teenager, I was doing 80k a month. Holy shit! For yourself or yeah, the whole per, business? Personal payout. Holy shit! And I used that money to move to California when I was 18. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then my Tumblr got banned. Everything got banned. Really? Yeah, they, they just delayed everything. Because they, they're like, why are these people making more money than us on their platform? And they just fucking deleted it? Everything's gone. I, 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 I never understood the fall of Tumblr. Can you like... So that sounds like that may have played a, a, a factor. Like, Well, they, they obviously banned a lot of creators, which is the people bringing traffic to their site. But mm -hmm. obviously, we're just a small part of their entire platform. What really got them to downturn was... Um, well, two things. One was the natural pathway of a social media platform. Eventually, it would die out because new ones came out. TikToks, Instagram, Snapchat. That really drew a lot of their user base. And then once they banned porn... I was like, okay, GG. There's, there's no, there's no point to go back. Yup. Yeah. The amount of porn I would see on Tumblr, and it was always like super moody and tasteful. Like I don't know they're why. Good. You, yeah. you, they're perfectly curried. Yeah. It was like, man, this is like love. It's not even like fucking. You know. What I'm <laughs> you know what I'd be curious about, right? You had like such early young success, and you, and you kind of had to figure it out on your own. Well, for me, a turning point in my life was when, um, in community college, I read the book Outliers. And I was like, oh, like if you do 10,000 hours in, in something you're passionate about, then you could be the Beatles. What was that? Like maybe Gaia Forum, but what were like some of the things where you're like, yo, this was the turning point in how my brain shifted? Once I realized um, I can create anything and there, was, there will be someone that will buy. I think like what I realized when I was running all those ad posts for sponsors, that if sponsors are willing to pay me this amount of money to – to promote their stuff, I can create that stuff and promote it myself. Like really taking the power back to us. Like why would I take a $500 sponsorship and I can sell $5,000 of merchandise? So I was trying to figure out how much I was selling for the sponsorship, I'm like nah, I can do that. And I can make products, like products are pretty easy to make once you know Chinese. <laughs> um, and, and I was starting in apparel, like apparel is one of the easiest thing to get into. Um, and then I got into culling book. Like I made a meme culling book, which basically sold itself. Okay. Well, no. So let's talk. Okay. So you go Drake sweater, Bernie Sanders sweater, apparel. Let's talk about the meme Bible because that yeah. was a big. 2016, I was making a lot of memes. Like my entire Tumblr account was funny stuff, like memes. And at the time, a lot of our stuff actually gets circulated to Instagram. You get reposted. Nowadays, it's tweets or like they make their own on Instagram now. But there was a time when Instagram content came from Tumblr. And then it got shifted to screenshotting tweets, and then now they make their own stuff with the Instagram story stuff. Um, so I realized that I was capitalized on a digital version of something. Why not make it into physical content? So for at the end of the year, I think it was around November. It was Thanksgiving. I was at my ex-girlfriend's house at the time. And I started piecing together memes, but outlined the illustration of the memes. So like, for example, Donald Trump was fighting for the presidential election during that year. So I, I drew an outline, I illustrated an outline of him. And there was like a frog riding a, a unicycle. There was one. 
Arthur um, from the oh, yeah. cartoon. The, the so I, fist one? Yeah, so I, I did an one. outline of all that in Illustrator, and I put it into, uh, I made it into like InDesign pages. Um, and then I Photoshop a rendering of what that book would look like. I didn't have any inventory on the time. I put it on Tumblr, and what I did was Photoshop that on top of a BuzzFeed article and say, um, this is the hottest selling coloring book of this year. Here's why. And that's it. Just a picture of it. And that picture generated, I think, $150,000 within the first week. Oh, my goodness. It was just a picture. We didn't have any inventory on hand. Literally just a picture. And like, but you were, but people were buying the physical product or like. They're they, buying the physical product. Okay. But, but the thing is, I sold all that stuff not knowing how well it would do. Uh-huh. So first and foremost, I was freaking out. Um, <laughs> and then second was, I didn't know how to make it. Like I literally just made a design, thought it would be funny if I put it out there and see how many would bite. Never happened to me before. Um, and so you, then, so you so basically it, like fabricated a BuzzFeed article and it went viral on Tumblr and you, oh my goodness. And yeah. now you had, so now, so, okay. So then what did you have to do? Um, figure out how to print books. <laughs> and this was during like Christmas. Like I made that during Thanksgiving and it was around December 6th. How the, old were you at this point? 19. Oh my goodness. I it was like first, I was sitting in my community college classroom taking an exam. Um, what, and what were you going to school for? Comp sci. <laughs> Hold on, I want to know what you were doing at nineteen. I'll tell uh, you what I was doing. Yeah, too. yeah. So at nineteen, I had graduated high school. Didn't get into at any... nineteen. That's a little late. Oh no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, so well, previous to nineteen, I got into no schools because uh-huh. I had negative grades, <laughs> and then I was in community college, like smoking weed and playing Modern Warfare two, like eight hours a day and failing community college. Uh-huh. I was just doing mad drugs in college. Like that. <laughs> yeah. I was not focused on college. I was like more focused then. Like I had almost failed my first semester freshman year, and that like made me wake the fuck up. So then I got like good grades next semester and the time after that. But then I was like working in a restaurant to make money to go back to school, but spending like eighty percent of what I was making on festivals, drugs, clothes. Dude, me too. I was working as a sushi chef. That's when I thought at of nineteen. Yeah. Oh shit. Like my Tumblr got got banned and uh-huh. shit. And so I was just, I, I got a job as a sushi chef. Because you literally spent all that money that you had made. Yeah. I okay, don't okay. blame you. You were yeah, 14. Yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 what wait. did you buy? Yeah, 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 yeah. How are you blowing that much what money? What were your frivolous teenage purchases as a, <laughs> as a teenage entrepreneur? Um, I got a car. I got a nice apartment. I got, um, I actually bought a lot of my friend's stuff. I, I was helping out my homie. I was giving money left and right. They're like, oh, yo, I need help. Here's money. Help for what at that age? Yeah, what did they need yeah, money yeah, for? Yeah. I don't know, but I had, I had some cash, so I helped them. And then my, my account got banned, so I have no source of income. So I'm like, all right, let's get a job. Um, so I was rolling sushi, and that's when I thought of the meme Bible idea. Anyway, so December 3rd is when I launched it. First day, make four grand. The next day, make eight grand. The third day, make 11 grand. The fourth day, make 13 grand. <laughs> and then I remember sitting in my um, cal- calculus classroom, doing our exam. December 6th is when you do your final exam. I looked into my phone. I was like, okay, this is the first day I did $13,000. I'm just going to quit. So I literally dropped the pen and walked out. <laughs> I'm like, ah, I don't really. Do I really All right, 13000 That's That was the number I was waiting for. I'm leaving. A day? That, that yeah, was enough for me. Insane. That was yeah. validation for me. I was like, okay, this is something bigger that I need to put my time towards. Like, do I want to sit out for the next three years? For something or do I want to like double down on this one and so after that I made a bath bomb I made candle line I made a cookbook I made four more years of the meme bible um, and that really became its own business how did you make a meme cookbook like how are you making a Drake meme into a recipe um, really like either name inspire or like something related to the meme so we, hotline wing and it's like a chicken wing I, we didn't do that recipe, oh. but that's a good one. Um, but <laughs> yeah, essentially a curated uh, three chefs. One of them actually became really famous on TikTok. Now her name is Korean Vegan. Oh, I know her. Yep. Yeah. Good. So uh, Joanne and I go way back. She was actually like my first supporter on Tumblr. She Whoa. found me on Tumblr and I didn't have 500 bucks an hour to hire a lawyer at the time. That's how much her fees are. She's like, yo, it's okay. I'll just help you out. So she looked through my contracts for me and we became homies ever since then. And then she was pitching me the idea of, hey, I want to do vegan food blogging uh, called The Korean Vegan. This was five years ago. She pitched me that. And today she has 3 million followers on TikTok. She's very big on TikTok, yeah. yeah. Dude, this motherfucker, like early, because I grew up on the internet or whatever, I'm like, dude, I used to grow up watching this. He's like, oh, yeah, this is my friend. Oh, we did this. Oh, I helped him with this. His network is so insane of just like those early content create. Like they weren't even like content creators at that even point. Even Party Shirt. 
Really? Um, Par- Party Shirt pitched me their content at USC three years ago. Did what? they go to USC? Yeah. Xavier. No, no, no. Here's the best part of this story. They went to USC. He was a 19-year-old kid teaching at USC. Uh, holy shit. Yo, you're the fucking person that my mom used to compare me to. <laughs> she, like, when, when I'd be playing League of Legends in my room and my mom would pull up with some convoluted story of like one of her friend's kids and I'm like, yeah, that guy's not fucking real. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm also 16 and look what I'm doing. I'm not... It's not possible. And now I just met this guy, the fucking unicorn from my mom's story. Yeah. When I was in high school, first business selling phone cases, 500 bucks a month, easy stuff. And then I was also selling on eBay, just learning how to do it. They didn't know any, how to run ads. Clothing brand um, called Trendy Co. I think I was clearing like 150 a year. Did that for two years, like 16, 17 years old. And then 18 is when I started um, Meme Bible around that time. Meme Bible did about quarter million the first month. <laughs> um, and then end of the year doing, I think, 400 grand that year. So within those two months of launching, no, I, actually within that month and a half of launching, 400 grand. And then the next year, we scale it to 1.1 million. Same book. I mean, different book, but like same book series. Um, and then I started in, introducing like bath bombs and candles. And I even made a board game. Um, so following years, we're doing like around 1.5 to 2 mil. Um, and leading up to like now I do beauty brands and but before the beauty brands I was also doing a lot of other brands I never post about like home decor stuff like that one did about 3.2 million in one summer and then now dough I started dough with $500 um, purely on inventory I, I did all the marketing myself I I didn't hire a designer I learned how to do design to do it just to prove that to people that I can build something with 500 bucks. It's not like I didn't have money to start it at the time. But I'm like, okay, 500 bucks, can I start something? And now that turned into a $50 million brand. You know what you're like? You're, you're like, you're like uh, you know, you're playing a video game and you're so good at it that you're like, let me go on the prestige level like right away. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, could, I could take the beginner route, but I'm going to prestige right now. I'm going to start with $500. Like, that's fucking crazy, that, man. That's a, cra- that's a crazy challenge. We'll, we'll talk about Del more after we spin the wheel. Mm. No hey. Hey, hey, get the red. Uh, can we get one of the red? Oh, yeah. Cups? So you ever taken a blowjob shot before? No. Never? Have you seen one? No. All right. So all it is is like it's a shot, right? We're not going to use this one because it's glass. It's a little difficult. But <laughs> you're going to have, you're gonna have like a shot and you got to like kind of put your hands behind your back and take the shot like with your mouth only. So you're like this. Okay. That's the next three. Yeah. For the next three shots. Yeah, yeah. For the bust next three drinks. So you don't bust your teeth. Yeah. I actually did bust my teeth as a kid. Really? I, I was... Playing with a chair, it fell, knocked my front tooth out. Oh, but like your adult teeth or like? <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. Wait, yeah. wait, as a child, like what were you, like your mom was like, dude, my kid's making businesses. Like what do your parents think? I didn't tell my parents what I did for the longest time. Really? They didn't know idea you were making this like retarded They just know that I was like making money because mm-hmm. I was buying my mom, like she, she wanted like a winter coat. I got her a goose. It's like, how, how yeah. did I get 900 bucks to buy that. So you did, think did you're selling drugs? Yeah, I was about to say, did they ever think you're doing something illegal? <laughs> no, I, I don't think I can ever survive in, the, in that world. <laughs> um, I, I just told her I was doing like marketing. I was like advertising for businesses. I kept it very vague. I, like, I don't think my business, my, my family actually knew what I did until a newspaper came out in China about me. Damn. Like, that was written in Chinese. Because like, I have like 40 some publications on me, but purely on English. They never understood what that was. So for the longest time, they're like, yeah, he's just doing jack shit. But he, he's surviving, so he's chill. I never asked him for money. So. And, then they, and then when they figured out like, what, how successful you were, were it, what, like, what was that like? They're like, oh, shit, let's go. <laughs> and, and they were like, we birthed the genius. Yeah, they're like, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like, as, as Asian parents, for the longest time, I was getting compared to, like, yeah, you know, your cousin went to MIT, your cousin went to, like, Purdue or whatever. And, like, my mom could never say that, but, like, all my aunties were like, yo, my kid did this X and Y. And my mom could never have anything to say back to them. So when I was able to show something for it, I make sure everyone knew. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. That's the, that's similar to uh, what Tim uh, Tim Delaghetto was saying. How like he knew he really made it. When his dad used to like, even though he was big on YouTube, the way his parents would talk about him was like, oh, he's going to school for this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then one day it switched to my son's famous on YouTube or like my son does YouTube. And yeah. that was like the thing they would brag about. So yeah. like, I feel like that is like a mark of like, oh, I'm finally making it. My, my Asian parents understand. Yo, yeah, yeah. Oh, you got- <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was a unique way. That was like a very interesting right, technique. So I was gonna try to oh, warn you. Oh, do you usually like put your whole mouth around it? Uh, you never yeah. given a blowjob? Come on, man. <laughs> like, Jesus, this guy. Wait, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. I mean, because you're born from the internet, Jason is just a troll. You're the biggest shit poster. I am. Like, I love doing it. Yeah, yeah. Well, dude. So, well, so here's the thing. Like for me, I discovered you because one of my friends. When I was trying, dude, I didn't understand the e-com world at all. It was music marketing, whatever. I didn't understand Facebook advertising and how literally those people at the time when it was hot controlled the internet and was controlling who was buying you. I didn't realize that. But one thing I noticed right away out of his Twitter profiles, out of everybody else, was how much like real value he would give. Mm-hmm. Here's how I run my funnels. Here's how I do X, Y, Z. I'm like, why is this giving away all the sauce? He's, there's got to be some hidden intention. There wasn't. And then on top of that, I would message him for questions, and he was the only person that would just respond. Wouldn't try to like sell me anything like the gurus would just be like, yo, here's what you do. Here's what you're doing. Like, here's what you should look at. And I was like, I don't get it. Like, I don't get it. Like, what's in it for him? Yeah, I feel what you mean. So, like, where does that come from? Like, wh- like, wh- like why do you give away so much of your, your, your sauce? I think this is intrinsic. Um, there, there's two way, two things that really power this. One was that I wish I had this when I was younger. I started when I was 14. There's no one making tweets or blogs on how to start an e-commerce. I had to figure all that shit by myself. So I'm like, okay, there's probably a bunch of people just like me out there. What can I do to help them? Just giving back. You know, I, I made enough money. I don't think just teaching another person how to do something is gonna hurt me. So I love teaching. Um, and and two is that. I think by teaching and giving more, it will always come back to you. And that really has. Like, I've gotten um, advisor opportunities for nine, ten-figure brands. Like, really, really massive brands that are like, yo, Jason, can we bring you on to our advisor seat to, to consult us? I would never have gotten that unless I put myself out there. So, in a way, it does come back to me. But my main intention was never to be like, let's make some money off these people learning. Because so many people are doing that. They're posting in front of Lamborghinis and private jets and be like, yo, buy my course, 997, and I'll teach you how to do this. That shit never works. Because you're selling a lifestyle that's not attainable with what we're doing. Building a brand is super hard. It, it's so expensive. There's a lot of nuances that people never talk about. And I want to showcase that. With that being said, though, you started building Dell with 500 bucks. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Let's talk about dough. Why? Like, how did you? How did you come up with dough? For we know, but like for the layman, how did you come up? With, why did you choose dough? Why was that your next foray? Start there. I was on a flight to Hong Kong to look at suppliers for Mean Bible, and I was listening to a podcast saying uh, about how these people started a, a magnetic eyelash store. Um, and how they made like 500 grand off of it. I'm like, okay, I can definitely do better. So it was a challenge. And then at that time, I also had a girlfriend who was struggling with her eyelashes. And I, after listening to that podcast, I started talking to her. I'm like, yo, what's wrong with your eyelashes? Why is it bothering you? Um, and is there anything out there that's really, really good? And it's like, really, there really wasn't. So I look at, I, I start surveying people around me. I survey 100 girls give them a type form and say, here are like, all the <laughs> questions. Yeah, I, I sent it to everyone in, in my network that I knew um, were wearing lashes, and I start figuring out their pain point. Well, lashes are uncomfortable. They're really heavy. They're really expensive unless you get like um, the dollar store one, but the dollar store ones last you one time. Um, they look fake because it literally looks like you put fake hair on your eye, eyes, um, and they never last throughout the day. A bunch of pain points. So I start breaking them down, like, okay, what can I do on a design side to really fix this? Well, we use different materials. We fix the band to be at a certain width that is not uncomfortable, that will still be durable for multiple uses. Uh, we brought the price down to $12, $13, which is half of what the high-end lash companies charge for the same amount of quality. And it is definitely on a pricer side if you're buying from the drugstore, but we're not competing for that type of customer. We're competing for people that are typically buying $30 lashes, but now can pay $13 for an even better version. So we launched that. And the other thing that we were looking at is what was a customer segment that was underrepresented that we felt like we can go after. And for us, that was Asian people. Mm-hmm. For the longest time, Western Beauty was never creating products for Asian people. Our eyes are fundamentally different. Um, and so we crafted the size and the branding and the styling to be fitting for Asian people. 
but the name was called Do D O U X. That was our first name. I didn't have Do at the time. Uh, we launched that, and we what, did. What's the name? What's the what's the do? Uh, do? Yeah, where does that come from? It's a French word for soft and gentle, mm. soft and sweet. Mm. Um, which we soft I thought. And do you speak French? <laughs> <laughs> See, that was a misconception that I had. It was like I thought I could I need to conform to the Western beauty standards of naming convention like L'Oreal or Lancome. Mm. So I'm like, okay, let's do something fancy from French. Um, but that ended up not being the right case because that was a misalignment. If I'm going after Asian people, why would I have a French name? Mm -hmm. So that was something that I learned as a mistake. And so a year after, we, we went to a Korean branding agency, the same company that did a lot of major brands like E2 House and Dipping Dots. Um, and, Dipping Dots, that's wild. And yeah. we got them to redesign our entire brand deck. Wow. Um, and then, How much did that run you, by the way? Sixteen thousand dollars. Sixteen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we spent all our money. That was all the cash <laughs> in our account. But we got a payment terms like half, half up front, half later. It was worth it. It was worth every single penny. Branding mm -hmm. is so, so important, um, and having uniform branding across all your platform was really the key to make people remember us. From the jump, uh, you know, even when. We first came up with the idea of Nectar. There was only one human in my brain that was like, that could do it. It was this sick fuck over here. But like, name, find anybody that can do it all. This box is hand designed by him. The text, this Nectar text is hand painted by him. Wow. The cherub is hand. When I sent him the idea, I was like, we, we were like going back and forth on, about it. And I was like, yo, like we wanted something hard with the text because it's hard seltzer. We also want guys to be able to look at it and be like, that's cool. And also at the time, girls were wearing Purpose by Justin Bieber and he was stealing Metallica font, Fear of God. So we're like, we want hard font. Also, I grew up very Christian. And I was like, biblical. Like the idea of it's nectar. We're serving the nectar of the gods. So this is like old English. And then I said, oh, what if we come up with like, you know, it's like a little angel like, or, or like a cherub or whatever. 20 minutes later, he sends me a text, and it's like a sketch in his notebook, and it looks exactly like this. We have Which it. one? This one or this one? Both. Both. He had Nectar with the angel next to it, side by side. I have the screenshot to this day. In 20 minutes, and all of this is hand-painted. The fruit logos, the mountains. The only thing that's not hand-painted is the, the, like, the type. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be telling all my friends that. I'm like, yo, you see this? This is hand-painted. Hand-painted. <laughs> hand-painted. People, people are like, yo, but then here's the best part of it. He codes our website. He designs. He does the TikToks. Like he built this. He hand this. What were he hand built this? You don't find that. This Johnny Ive over here. I I actually I, I would say like one of the inspiration for why I invested in Nectar was the creative. Uh, so it I, wasn't me. It was him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ba basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the that's second what I, the in. second I seen Brando, I was like. Get, Yes, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the questions I did when I did my DD was like, who's, who's your creative person? Is it in-house or did you find an agency? Dude. And, yeah, I, I think like the fact that it was in-house, like someone that was part of your team, made me a lot more confident because so much of the branding and what draws people in is a creative. If you have an agency who's only making some one-time package for you and then they dip and you're not, gonna, you're not able to like persistently yeah. create the same visuals, it's not easy to bring them out. So back to Doe then, why did you choose an agency? Because I would never ever build a brand off of an agency for that reason. For the also thing that like, I've, I've known him for six years. I've seen him develop artists and create the whole, St. John, Gallant, Zoo, they like, these are like all their branding is so on point. So it's like, for me, I would never go like, how are you able to also then continue it, right? We didn't have the option. <laughs> Um, it, we, we didn't have the person to be like, let's yeah, bring I've, you on as a partner. I've never met anyone that, that could that's even potentially unicorn. be that person. That's unicorn. a unicorn. Yeah. Like, like Brando's a unicorn. Get off your high horse. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, if you want to talk about a giant horn, uh, <laughs> we can talk about that too. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm that serious. Like, uh, do I want to go to an agency? No, of course not. No one ever wants to go to an agency. But you just landed on the right one. You yeah. got lucky, kind of. Yeah, and then we brought on designers that were able to understand the branding. Because the branding is, is really good. That's another thing I noticed, too. The, the other thing, too, I noticed about you is when I was looking at Doe, I was like, everybody's, all these e-com gurus are launching brands, and they're all the fucking same. But you actually, like, okay, let's talk about e-com brand versus building a brand. And what do you think is the difference? Because everybody throws the word brand around. You know what I'm saying? And like, what differentiated you, right? Brand is made up of a lot of components. Some are your tagline, your slogan. Nike's just do it. There's a meaning behind it, right? And a lot of their visuals that 
they have by photograph and videography really supports a just do it movement. They show athletes just doing it. They show normal people just skating and just doing it. So the tagline was really important. We had something that was very, very special to us, which was uh, weightless comfort. And another one that we developed was for your eyes only. Um, something that okay. we try to, um, yeah, we trademarked it. We just got the trademark for your eyes only. And look at the hat, everybody. Um, and so tackling was important. We knew exactly what we stand for. We wanted to create comfortable eye products that was weightless. So we had that. That's we had, such a fire tagline, yeah. by the way. Who came up with that one? <laughs> we had uh, we had our colors. Our colors really reflected our brand motifs too. So like the soft pink, blue, and the and the beige was soft because our products are also soft. So those two things tie back together. Um, what really makes a brand, uh, as opposed to someone who just created an e-com store and calling it a brand, is the community, the people that really stand and really fucks with us. Um, those are the people that we cultivate really, really early on. We, part we help our community participate in our decisions. They help figure out what our next launch is. They help advise on our marketing campaigns. They mm -hmm. give us feedback. Where? Where are you doing Discord. this? We're building on a Discord community. And you've been building than that from the jump? Um, not from the jump. We started from Instagram, so like close friends, and then we put it into Discord. Um, but I think having all those things put together and having a very well-defined mission for what your brand is and what you're trying to solve was really what differentiated us from any other last brand creating it. Like I've seen so many copycats and all power to them. Like, you know, they probably watch my video. I'll, I know a lot of them follow me and they create their last brand. All love. I'm not here to be like, yo, take them down or whatever, because I want to create the next generative entrepreneur. But what really sets us apart was that they are just trying to create the idea of us, but we're really creating something that's different, something that is differentiated. When you see our color, when you see our brand motifs, our cloud emoji, um, our, our slogan, you know immediately that's dope. You can't really re recreate that unless you put a lot more time into it. What is your grand vision for for what is your grand vision for Doe and what do you want to do for yourself? What do you see your life like in, in 10 years? Great question. Um, we are going to become an eye brand. We're going to be a place where you got to find comfortable eye products. So over the next couple of years, we're developing a lot of products in that category. So color contact lenses is something that we're coming out next year. We're coming out of eye drops. You know, traditionally, you're getting eye drops from the pharmacy. It looks like, it literally looks like a drug. Yeah. Uh, we want to make eye drops sexy, but also functional. So we're going to develop them in Japan, where I think has the best eye drops. Uh, we're working on lash growth serum for people that don't want to wear lashes, but they still want to prolong their eyelashes. So creating new formulations in that regard. So not only confining ourselves to selling lashes, but we want to make everything eyes. Great. So the other question, though, is so... Uh, building communities and some of the strongest communities come from crypto uh, so tell us about for the layman explain nfts and your first entry into that world so the value of nft really comes down to a few things number one is um, hype i i can tell you for sure that a lot of NFT are over hype and overpriced um, I don't go for those unless I'm trying to flip them. If I'm trying to flip them, I don't care about the fundamentals. I'm just going for the social volume, how many people are talking about it. Definitely flipped a lot of NFTs that way. Two is the utility of it. Is there utility in holding that art project? Um, some art projects allow you to have the ability to force them into real products. Um, you have the ability to get early access to your next project. So there's utility in holding the NFT. And then the third one is really just, if you like something and you want to collect it, why not just buy it? Like there's so many people that buy art that put in their room that no one else can see. If you like art, digital art, and you want other people to see it, you can buy the NFT and prove your ownership on the blockchain and even have your own virtual gallery. Um, there's a lot of people putting efforts into building the metaverse like Facebook is doing so. Mm -hmm. They have 10,000 employees just purely in the VR and AR department. 10,000 employees. Um, so I'm seeing the future moving towards digital, um, especially with a lot of the supply chain issues that we're seeing today. Like people are not getting their products on time. More and more people are staying at home rather than going out. There is a increased amount of interest in the digital world, and I want to be the first for it. Uh, NFT, what, what are some yeah, NFT yeah. projects you made the most money on currently as of today? Cool Cats. Cool Cats. Cool cats. Okay, I remember. I've seen you post about that. Yeah, I was telling everyone to buy cats when they were like two oh, ETH. Well, how how long ago did you uh did you did you drop this? August twenty fourth. Hearts Project. Fuck, man. Yeah. Did I know you back? I didn't know you back then. Uh -uh. Fuck, man. But the thing Fuck. is, it's all public. Like I was telling people what I buy. Uh -huh. People can't tell. Like, oh, he's bullshitting. Like, you literally can see what I buy. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. 
like tough, you know, for a lot of people. Like, what what did you buy Cool Cats at, and what's it at now? I bought them at like one point two ETH. That's still like you know three grand, four that, grand. Was that mint price? No, that was no, secondary no. price. That was secondary. But what price. is it at now? Ten. The ten? Cheap, Ooh! cheapest you can get is ten ETH. Ten Ooh! Ethereum. For but cool for the cats. one that I bought, it's about twenty. The floor. Oh my god. For that particular trade. Here's my gripe with these NFT projects, and I get it, right? Like it's like it's cool, whatever it is. Or, or what flipped my brain? I was like, dude, none of these people are really building. Like, I understand that people are hyped on the technology and what it can be and, and change the landscape. But the project that I like was more impressed by was the Hearts Project. And only because I thought it was like, I didn't think it was. I was like, oh, this is another NFT project. They're promising a lot of things. But they kept doing in real life events consistently. And they'd bring people together. And I was like, okay. This is completely different because they're giving you a real life value. And the people that were in that community or whatever, like you would be a Joe Smo and you go to the party and then all of a sudden you're meeting like this high level exec or whatever. And he's yep. just like, hey, who are you? Like we have this shared interest. And I was like, oh, the in real life aspect to me. Huge. Yeah. So and they're the only one that's doing it consistently. Think, think of this like um, let, let's just use like Bore Apes Yacht Club as an example. That's one of the most well known mm-hmm. ones. Um, they're building a little, uh, an actual yacht club in yep, Miami. Yep. Um, building into this type of community gets you access to people that you wouldn't have access to before. And a really good example, I want to take a little step back here, is uh, two months ago I went to Monterey Car Week. This is the entire week of car events, and I love cars. And I have a friend who's a Ferrari collector, so she invited me into a Ferrari party. You walk into that party, and it's only Ferrari owners and collectors and people who have driven no plebs. Yo, that's exactly. You, you're I saw, not there. I saw an inter- exactly no people <laughs> like me allowed. But I saw an interview about that exact concept where he, the dude was like, "I bought a a Rolls Royce, some type of crazy Rolls Royce," and he was like, "I would never buy a car like this." But it's an investment because now I go to all the Rolls Royce meetups, yeah, and I meet Rolls Royce owners. He's like, and we do business, and it's yeah. like it's taking my business yeah. from so, like so so same concept. I was yeah. in a Ferrari party, and like you know, I I don't have a Ferrari, but my friend does. Mm. And I was able to mingle with all these other found, like founders, like businessmen, lawyers, and I'm able to get some deals out of it. So in a way, build it, being in this club and having the NFT to prove that you have it, because they didn't know that I didn't have a Ferrari. I could have just lied and said I, I drive like a Ferrari. But at the Bal- Borea uh, Art Club, Yacht Club, you have to prove that you own one and you're mm. in it. If you own it and you, you're in it, they know that at the very minimum you have one. I'm just imagining everybody. He's like, "Yo, I did deals at this Ferrari club," and I just imagine everybody's like walking out with like fake eyelashes. <laughs> oh, like, but you get it right. Like, there's that community yes. aspect, like that exclusivity mm-hmm. that you cannot get, and it's proven. But so here's where my frustration lies a little bit. Is back then, I, lo- I I'm pro the early guy that got into board a Biop club or a crypto punk when they were minting it for free. Giving them out to people, but just because. But now, because of what NFTs has become, you're never gonna get a board ape yacht. There's never. new projects coming out every single day. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and- yeah. But to build it to like what board ape is, whatever, like it's gonna be very. It's two million it's, bucks, dude. Now. It's the same thing as any like new industry. Is like when things come out, like you're everyone's like fuck. Like when will this ever? It's like. I don't know, like social media, right? Like for every like Facebook, there's also like the ones that failed, you know what I'm saying? But there's also TikTok like years later that comes mm. out and is also, uh, it's a player in the game. And and like, you know, there's like a few things that make NFT projects valuable in my opinion. It's like DAOs and then like real life, you know, things like Hearts Club doing real life events. Network. Yeah, exactly. Like and membership club, like where it's like your ticket into a club. I had this idea for like, masterminds right you know like high level entrepreneur masterminds how like you're buying basically you're buying a ticket into a seat at the table mm-hmm. but like what like that is something that would like making it an nft based oh, you know we what didn't saying? Beep, is like, sir oh no I, I didn't drink enough oh god, I got yeah, make, I making now. it making it uh making that an nft would just only like you know what i'm saying like one increased profit for everyone involved because anyone that sells it makes their money back the owner the guy that started the mastermind gets percentage of every sale like you know in between I don't know. There's just so many, like, there's going to be a lot more projects because all, at the end of the day, NFTs are kind of just like connect. I think the NFTs that will succeed are connected to like real life organizations. Basically Do you know companies. there's a, there's a organization, there's a group, a discord server, discord called friends of benefits. You ever heard? Yes. Of- they're killing it. Is friends that an NFT of- project or? No, it's not an NFT talking. project. It's like a digital Soho house. Yeah. What's and Soho house? Soho house is a exclusive Pleb. membership <laughs> 
a only clubhouse. They have a few locations here and there, but you need to pay to it's get worldwide, in there. like London, um, Canada. Oh, right. Damn, I'm Yo, a fucking nobody. Don't you fucking... know, hey, hey, they got a steam room at some of them. I don't know if that's here's so the thing. No made that club? Up. Like, what what is it exactly? It's literally business? a Discord server. Um, Friends with Bennett. No, no, wait. No, no, I no, want to no. know about Soho. If Soho House first, what? That's like a real club, like a like uns, uns, uns club. No, 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 no. no, it's no. Like Physical dinner. locations, restaurants, and workspaces. It's like we work for not. I'll, I'll not take the you pores. next time. What um, about me? I got you. I got you. But <laughs> here's the thing, though. Friends of Benefit. They're like you need to have 75 FWB Friends of Benefit token to to be in there. So you can literally prove that you have 75 in order to be in there. If you don't have 75, kicked. All right. That token initially was like, you know, a few hundred dollars to get in. Now, whoa, 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 wait, so seventy-five equal tokens to. equal to two hundred bucks, or yeah. you're saying seven? Yeah, because oh, yeah. okay, okay. each token had a value to yeah, it. Yeah, right? yeah, it was like it, it was three like, bucks, it was like two bucks. Okay, right. okay. Today to get in, I believe I don't know if the price changed. It was like eleven thousand dollars. Seventy-five FW Holy token. Shit. So, per token? No. Oh. 75 equals to 11. I was like, I'm never yeah, that's like a, Last time I checked, it might have lowered a little bit, but it was like 140 bucks per token. Okay, okay, so my follow-up question, though, is what? who is coming out of Friends with Benefit being like, yo, like, Drake's in, in this. Like, like, what's coming out of it? Well, give me some stories. Do you what know are they anyone doing? that's in there? Or yeah, like, give me some stories of I don't what's know, happening like, for the community. I don't know anyone in particular, but I believe it's like a private club where people share like signals. Oh, get this NFT because I am on mm. their board. Or like get this because I know they're about to blow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like, hey, let's do some business in here. It's like super high level shit. The value of the token actually increased as the quality of the post of, of the club came up. So everyone mm. who's in it is reaping the benefit of it. You might have gone in when it was $5,000 to get in, but now it's $11,000. So double question though now. A lot of people have eleven thousand dollars to spend. They let anybody in at this point, or they're still curating it because that's important. It's not curated. You have you have seventy five FW tokens. You get you're in. in. Yeah. You're so in. see that can mix shit up though because there's just a lot of people in this world, and it's like to create a great cl- like yeah, but you to, still got to be the type of eleven. Even if you have eleven thousand dollars, if you're the type to want to drop that on connections just to. For anything, like even if you're not contributing value, you know what I'm saying? You can drop that and, and just take value and leave. But like there's all I feel like they will have like certain people in there just like from just creating that environment that there will always be the people that one provide the most value, gain value as well. And there's always gonna be like the scrubs that just come in and like you know, invest in the things that people tell them, blah blah blah. It's like a you, you know anyone who's in there has at least eleven thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to put it in like a nicer way. It's like it, it kind of vets Fuck. out. And eleven thousand dollars to spend to join a club, more more importantly. Wait, but, but it's eleven thousand dollars and you never have to spend it again. But which also is cool. this, this is what I love about NFT and crypto stuff is that they buy tokens to join, right? And it's not like they have to give them the tokens to join. They own the tokens. So they join for eleven thousand dollars. The tokens rise in price. They want to leave the club. They sell the seventy-five tokens, right? Yeah. So exactly, like at the end of the day, you're just you're fronting eleven thousand dollars because when you leave, you can sell seventy-five tokens for you probably made, yeah, way yeah, more, more. more. And it's the same thing with the NFT if, membership clubs. Like you, there's a certain amount that are made, but like if you're ever like I'm not about this anymore, you want to leave, you're probably gonna make money for having been in the club. But that's the other thing too that I like. It's like that club, the value only goes up because you're like. If you're like, yo, I joined this club and it sucks, the value goes down. So you're mm. like, how do I, how how can I be a good member? I feel like that's a that's like an unspoken thing right now that you can't really research. Like, how do you create like a powerful membership club? But are you seeing all the people of the punks and the apes changing their profile picture, posting about it? Like, it incentivizes you to increase the value of it because, well, your money's on the line. So you're busting your ass on Twitter getting people to join your thing. Mm-hmm. Like, we're seeing a lot of that. Whenever you post something about NFT, like, you're going to see a flock of people saying, well, this is this, this is that, get this, because they want to increase the value of it. So yeah. they're actually going out there and trying to increase the value yep. of the community. Whether that's good or bad, we don't know for sure. Yes. But we're definitely seeing the apes and the punks. We're seeing VCs, like people who are very, very in a traditional money and even like suitor bees changing their profile picture to to an ape, that's crazy. That's fucking crazy. You dude, tell yeah. me that last year, not even this year, last year, I wouldn't have believed you. J- Jay Z's uh, profile on t- Twitter is a crypto punk, right? I don't know. I, I haven't checked, but like that, uh-huh. I believe it because Steph Curry did it. All the uh-huh. M- NBA players did it. You know. Also, uh, now Twitter's working on the verification thing, right? Yeah. For, yeah. To verify that you have it. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, which of out of all your skill sets would you attribute to most of your success? People. 
Like talking to people or understanding people? Both. Both. Okay. Mm. I'll elaborate. In, in, in a business world, 70% is the people that you know and how you can leverage those relationships. Not saying that it's purely transactional, but really knowing the right person gets you into the right stores. I agree. I agree. Um, and knowing how to knowing people gets you to manage your team more efficiently. Knowing the right people knows who to hire gets you those deals that you wouldn't have get otherwise. I can promise you that I can put someone in a room who is extremely good at people skill and another person with no people skill but really, really good technical knowledge. The person with the technical skill will get more fundraise than the person with just technical skills. The because, person with the people skills will get more fundraise. Yeah, and they will get more deals done. Mm -hmm. um, people skill is so underrated. Everyone's looking for a market or whatever. It's like, yeah, that's great. But like what keeps what brings those people in and what retains those people? The people skill. And that's and you so where did you sharpen that, right? Like you like you moved around, you didn't have friends, like how did you develop that? That shit was hard, dude. It was so hard. I grew up so socially awkward. Still am kind of. Um a little bit better. Um I mean moving around didn't really have a lot of friends. So I didn't really know what to do. And I got bullied a lot as a kid because I was the only Asian kid in the full Mexican school. You and, and lived in every state you mentioned was like Midwest and like South. Yeah, dude, and I was, I was, like, I was like one of the few Asian kids in Garden Grove. It was pretty like mostly Hispanics. Um, I go to Oklahoma. I was like one of the few handful Asian kids. They're like, what kind of Mexican are you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, like some took me in, but most didn't like, like me. Mm -hmm. And then I go to Florida. I lived in West Palm Beach, Florida. I, to give you context, Trump has a house there. Mm -hmm. Like I'm talking about rednecks. Like my classmate was like driving a lifted truck, chewing tobacco. Like that was a, oh, the yeah. environment that I was in. And, and so, he's like, you want to buy a char phone case charger? <laughs> but, that, but, but oh, they have money. They have money. Because my uncle had a restaurant there, so I just worked there. Um, so, so I was in West Palm Beach. But going back to the point, like, I never really had the chance to sharpen up my social skills. And I was really able to become social online because there was that monitor between me and the other person. It's like, I didn't have any fear. I'm, I'm whoever I want to be. You know, on Tumblr, my username was at Asian. That was me. You didn't know me as Jason. You just, you know, see my face here and there, but I was interacting as an avatar. Um, and that's kind of like why I really like NFT projects, just because you can be someone, you can be anyone within the metaverse. The question was like, how are you seeing around the corner? What do you read? Like, like, if you're willing to share, what are you reading? Who do you follow? What are you paying attention to, to make you understand like, oh, NFTs, oh, eyelashes, oh, e-com, like... Just what staying are ahead resources? of the curve. Like, yeah. who, who helps you stay ahead of the curve? Yeah, do you follow Gary V? like... No, I don't follow Gary Vee. Respect him a lot. Um, I don't follow him. I I don't really take one single thing from one single person. I take it as a whole. So a lot of people that I, I follow are marketers, so like Nick Shacker for Chase Dimon for email. I love Chase Dimon. Yeah, great guy. Um, I, I follow people that I really respect through the content that they put out. Um, there's like a long list of them, like 40, 50 people. But that's not the point. What I really like to follow are people outside of my industry. So I'm following the automotive industry. I'm following the, you know, the supply chain industry. I'm following um, home decor, food and beverages. I'm looking at what you guys are doing at Nectar and be like, how can I apply that at Doe? I, I don't, you know, when I'm running a beauty brand, I'm not looking at other beauty brands to emanate because you're just a step behind them. I look at what other industries are doing and how I can apply that within my own industry. Mm. So for like, for, for Doe, I was looking at Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz <laughs> does this thing where they, whenever they launch a new car, they have this thing called the Additional One. So a uh, Mercedes-AMG GTS Edition One. The Edition One has different designs and different, different features, and they only make a certain amount of it. So I'm like, okay, what can I do for it? So every single time that I launch a new product, I do a limited edition design for our product that is completely different, that's limited edition, you'll never get it again. And so I started taking inspiration from like Tesla, how they do their referral system. I started looking at Mercedes-Benz. I'm not looking God at- damn. I'm not looking at beauty to, to copy. I look at other industries and see what I can do. So you know what this reminds me Real of? Real quick, I'm so sorry, I have to pee so bad. Okay, yeah, yeah, but hold it for like two more seconds. You know what this reminds me of? Kanye West, he's the master sampler. Everything from like his album covers to like how, like if you look up YouTube, Kanye West samples every song, the greatest video ever. So uh, I'm impressed by that. That's very, very cool. <laughs> Any, anyways, uh, yeah, so the question I was going to ask, or not question, more opinion. Did you watch Ready Player One? Yeah. Did you watch Ready Player One? No, but I've read the book. Oh, you read the book? Yeah. Wow. Oh, what? I learned how to read last year. You know what, this. When did you read the book, though? 
Hold on. Uh, yeah, thank you, dude. Dude, thank you. Was that you. bothering you? Because that time, shit was bothering me. And I don't know if you saw me. I kept going like this. And, and you couldn't catch it? I couldn't catch it. It yeah. was bothering thank you. me, honestly. But are the banks good? Yeah, uh, the, the banks, banks are good, good now. Yeah, 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 yeah. everything's good now. Yeah, god damn. I know, but people gotcha. need to... Gotcha. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, but yeah, Ready Player One, you read yeah, the book. Yeah, I, I read it like in college. Isn't it a series of books? Yes, but I read the first one, so, so I know the, the concept. So the movie is based on the first book or the whole series? I think it's the first book. Really? It'd be hard to make a full movie off a of full but series. But it feels like it ended, you know what I'm saying? Like, they ended it. I don't know the movie. ending. Be- oh, you never watched the movie, right? No. I- so how do you feel about that movie and the reality of a metaverse like that? I think it's coming. Right? Like, exactly. Almost exactly like that, right? I, I mean, like, probably not exactly, because, mm-hmm. like, what we think is futuristic 20 years ago never really became the case. Mm-hmm. We're definitely seeing a big shift in the digital world. More and more people are buying things online. You're seeing people buy skins for CSGO or mm-hmm. buying for League of Legends. We're, we're going to see more of that. Um, more and more people are buying VR headsets because they want to, you know, do things that they couldn't do in real in the real life. And we're seeing that with Grand Theft Auto 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Like, people want simulations. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely think we might see some kind of Ready Player, player One mm-hmm. situation in the real world. The, the way that it fully converts where people are like, fuck the real world, I'm going to the VR world, is when porn feels real. <laughs> I swear to God, dude. Like, at the end of the day, you cannot... You cannot beat human interaction. Yeah, so, because of that. I don't. But even in Ready Player One, they couldn't... They, didn't, they never defeated that part. Dude, dude listen to this. So, so... Uh, I don't. I haven't watched porn in many years. I don't sure. know. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 My friend had an, like the most updated version of Oculus, and mm-hmm. of course, I was like, so I'll go to a verse, and he was like, talk. <laughs> he was talking up his Oculus, and I was like, dude, how good could it be? And so I put on the set, and the first Oculus scene was like traveling the world, and it was really realistic and cool. But I'm like, I'm bored of this. I'm standing in your living room. I was like, let's be honest. What's the porn like? He was like, let me show you. So he puts it on. or I, No, sorry. I put it on. It was wild because it was like you're in first person of the porn star that shot it. And you look down and you see his dick and you're fucking the girl. The thing that freaked me out is he picks the girl up on the table. So it's me in first person. I pick the girl up on the table. And then she reaches for my mouth to put her hands in my mouth. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and, and, and it was still like VR. Uh-huh. It was still like VR. And... He was like, my friend was like, but when you're drunk, it's like, he told me, he's like, when you're drunk, it's 80% real. And I was like, whoa. For me, for me, if I was drunk, I think it would be 50% real. But when they start adding the attachments, imagine. Like the suit. The like suits. The yeah, suit. Yeah, yeah. When, Dude, when, the suit when you attach comes the out, flashlight bro. attachment and the girl has the stick attachment, I don't know what they got. And then, and then. Imagine when you can go into VR world and you're fucking Shrek with yeah. your fucking yeah. swamp dick. Yeah, yeah the, the 12 footers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just going around with Thundercock. Uh, and yeah, and you can fuck real life people, but they're avatar versions and you're still both feeling it. And they don't know who you, they don't know that you're this broke ass TikToker. <laughs> Hey, but literally, literally after Tumblr took porn off, the company tanked. So I'm telling you. But it's what? only, bro, Tumblr had like a, like an ecosystem that really just bred that, like similar to like Twitter, uh, where it was, it's like, you know, part of the attraction is the unfilteredness that you can get away with things on, with that you can't get away with on other platforms. Metaverse is not going to matter until sex becomes like better than real life sex. Or money. I think like once like even with Axie Infinity and shit like that like already people are making money off of like you know met- also that's a RuneScape I love using the analogy of RuneScape and these other MMORPGs where people would pay real life money for in-game items you know what I'm saying like and like it's just it'll cross over like you know what I'm saying on that topic who's like a cartoon character that you want to pork in the metaverse uh so many <laughs> but Timmy Turner's mom. Yes, Timmy Turner's mom is a good one. Yeah. Lola Bunny. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's bestiality, though. You think that's you're going okay. to prison? That, that's, that's okay. To, that's it's a made of version. You, you ever you seen Lola Bunny? <laughs> and I'm not talking about the LeBron Space Jam mm-hmm. version because mm-hmm. they did her dirty. Yeah. Fuck that version. Mm-hmm. The OG version. Uh, Judy <laughs> Hops from fucking Zootopia. Oh, my gosh. She was thick as She was thick as fuck. Yeah. And she was like two feet tall. Uh-huh. 
You could throw her around. Yeah. I've never seen I've never seen Zootopia. Fuck, so many anime characters. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Lucy from Fairy Tale. Yep. Um fucking Tsunade. Nar- I could go on forever about anime characters. We shouldn't even get into That's that. That's a whole honestly. different segment. Yeah. That's like a whole, I'm joining that universe. Wherever <laughs> that, you know, whoever makes that universe, I'm in there. Yep. Hey, the thing I heard about them is they don't like broke boys, so. <laughs> All right, don't okay. worry. Don't okay. worry. Okay. I'm in there. I'm going to be in there. Get your money. I'm not your funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when people are like, yo, I want to travel to a certain time. Like, if you could time travel, where would you go? And anybody that says, like, they would go to the 1700s, I'm like, dude. Who the you fuck would, is saying that? Dude, I don't, they're like, I want to see history. I was like, dude, no internet. Like, probably, depending on what race you are, you're no an host. instant. No hoes. Hey, well, dude, there well, were some pimp daddies. Don I, Quixote. I would say that I would, I would love to do that if I was in, like, spectator mode. I wouldn't like to be <laughs> dropped. I wouldn't like to be dropped into there in, like, some survival shit. Because, like, obviously, unless you gave me something. Like, if I had, like, you ever see the TikTok trend of, like, uh, when, as soon as I get out the, the time machine in like the 1700s, it's like, yo, listen to this. And then you put the AirPods on some random civilian is playing like Playboy Cardi. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so like, if I had something where I could like finesse my way into like being like a magician type, you know what I'm saying? Or like, I mean, back in the day, it was all about how much money you have. Yeah. Like three, 300 years ago, we were like building railroads across the country in America. And like, if you're going back to like, say Korea for you or China for me, we got to be in some royalties or we're peasants. Oh, there's no, shit. there's not even an option of like getting to the, like a yeah, higher there, There's bracket. a class system. I'm like, who the fuck wants to go back to that time? No way. Wu Talk walking around with like a black card in the 1700s. Like, no, I'm like, by the way, by the way, any kind of magic AirPods, they'd be like, you're a witch. We're going to hang you. Yeah. Perfect. Unless, no, I mean, I wouldn't, you think I'm stupid? I'm just pull up like, hey, I got AirPods. <laughs> no, nah, I would finesse that shit. I would find a noble, you know what I'm saying? Get close to him and be like, listen, I can do all, look, listen to this. I feel like you could recreate that for somebody today. So imagine if you went into the rural jungle anywhere, Asia, wherever it is, where there's people that have never seen a cell phone, that have never seen electricity. You go into a village and you put a sack over somebody's head. You put them on a jet, fly them to EDC Vegas, Main stage, 2 a.m., Skrillex. You drop them in the middle of the crowd for like three minutes. You put the sack back over his head and fly back to the village and you drop him off. Okay, for, first of all, uh, I think you need to see a therapist. Yeah, that, I also definitely, think that. that definitely. I, yeah, yeah. The one that's. Ex- I can't even believe that you thought of that scenario. But, but, but second, second, um, I think they, they, they're just so overwhelmed, like auditory. Um, overwhelmness, um, visuals, all the lights. Yep. Uh, I, I mean, the was jet, sure, was the sure, jet yeah. flying on a jet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we didn't even get to that point yet. But like, are you thinking about drugging them too? You want to pop like a little molly? No, 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 no. They stay completely fully sober. sober. They need yeah, to stay I think that's still like. Also, truly. most of those people are highly spiritual, and and raves like EDC is is a place of pure debauchery. Like 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 pure debauchery. You know what I'm saying? Like. Like, basically, everyone's naked, like, you know, and just, like, almost, like, it's, like, idol worship, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's some crazy shit. That's like, what I'm thinking. Imagine it's, like, DJ Snake. There's flames shooting. They would, There's they would 100 think people. they're in hell. They would think they're in their version <laughs> yeah, of the hell. Fl- the fires. 100,000 people Everyone staring at one guy. Some fucking motherfucker, yep. One guy. A gigantic be like, aisle. The, the yeah, owl. the owl, like, like you know, it, bro, there's, it, they would be like, oh, I fucked up, I'm in hell, like, they took me to hell early, like, <laughs> Start repenting. everyone is in, engaging in debauchery, like, you wouldn't even know what drugs are, but, you know, you, they, all, most indigenous cultures have some form of, like, psychedelic Ayahuasca. Thing. Yeah, exactly. Ayahuasca's been ancient. But then they're watching, think- they're watching people smoke so casually, you know what I'm saying, like, all around, like, also, the way people look when they're on drugs, molly out people are like, like, yeah. <laughs> And, and they're just, you know, they would immediately be like, I, I fucked up somewhere because this is so unpleasant, loud noise, screaming so much. I can't even hide it from this. Like, you know, like I would drop him in VIP or artist area. OK, you're, <laughs> you're so nice for that. That's yeah, a whole yeah, nother yeah. experience. So I will I say also that's give a whole nother like chicken tender. Just so he's like, <laughs> yo, because that could also be a hey, maybe when he tries the food, he, because that's delicious. Everybody likes sugar, salt. He'd be like, God damn, what is it? He was like. Was I in hell because the food they gave me? Was- I will, yeah, well, when you bring in food, it's a whole nother experience. You should start playing mi- like Sims or something. You're yeah, you're fucking up. crazy. You're fucked up. I, his Sims would be living like, a terrible life. Like, like the like. baby burning yeah, while you're like yeah. on a computer. He's hey. like cooking his children. <laughs> hey, that's what I'll do in the metaverse. <laughs> Other races don't have, they grow hair on their ass. I learned that. I grow hair on my ass. Like a lot? Like, yeah, low key. 
Damn. And the first okay. girl that ate it was just like, like ignoring that shit. I was like, holy shit. Wow. <laughs> Ew, bro. I, after that, I'm not gonna lie. I did one time shave my asshole because I was like, if this ever happens again, I want to be, I want to be prepared. That was disgusting. Why would you say that while I'm trying to drink? Why would you drink while I'm trying to say that? He's like feet left and right. He's like, yeah, oh, next time it comes. One time I nared my 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 asshole. That was... I don't recommend Yo, that, honestly. Getting your ass eaten once changed your life. I'm not! Damn, man. Because I haven't... I, I did that, like, a few times, and it was annoying, so I just... I haven't done it again. And, I, yeah, it's, like, it's nice, but, like, it's not something I look forward to every situation now. He's looking forward to it. Yeah. If it happens, it happens. He's I looking forward to it. it. But you will have to deal with the hair at this point. <laughs> your love life. You know... With uh, with success and power, what's your type? Um, I think at this point, it's just someone that understands the grind. You, you know, you got data law of girls that don't really understand that you just have to be working sometimes. Like, I'm checking my phone not because I don't care about you, but because there's shit going on. Because he's shit posting. <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, but I think relationship at this point is just finding someone that gets you. Um, you know, everything else aside, someone that understands what they're getting into. Um, and mutual understanding of like what it really takes to make this relationship work. Um, that's really been the challenge, but I think if you find the right person, that really helps. You found your new girlfriend very, very quickly. <laughs> Walk us through your process. Yes. Give us your tips. Hinge. <laughs> Hinge. <laughs> that shit never works for me, bro. Really? Yeah. I mean, it, like, I get matches and I talk to girls. I've been on dates, but like, there, I'm just like, man, you suck. Like, every time almost, like, I don't you, know. You have to play the game. What's the game? You, you can't be too em emotionally invested in it. You got to have oh, your I'm options. Never, I try, I'm yeah. never too I emotionally mean, when, like During that like 23 days when I was like really on the market, I was just like shooting shit on the wall. He was sticks. only on the market for 23 days. Hey, it's days. a numbers game for sure, though. It's been, two it's been almost two years for me. <laughs> it's been pretty much two years. When, and when, I have been shooting. Yeah. Hey, so, hey, maybe you look shooting in the wrong places. I Think am 100% that. shooting in the wrong place. I know that for a yeah, fact. Yeah, like shooting in the strip club, like that doesn't make any sense. I never go to strip clubs. Don't lie. You don't got to lie now. I literally camera. have not been to a strip club just since the, the second time. Uh, whatever. Just say yes. No. But listen, like, I, I've definitely went through, like, a lot of people during that time, and, you know, like, you really realize what you like and what you don't like, and I was like, I want someone who's, who's able to keep up an intellectual conversation, someone who's able to help me learn, someone that's really supporting and understands what I do and, like, how I do it, and, you know, it's one out of dozens of people I talk to that really fit that bill. All right, well, I, I need to know, top, top three qualities you look for in a girlfriend as a hyper-successful young person? Um, someone who's adaptive, like we're, we're going through shit all the time. Like I could be doing well today and then being like near bankruptcy next month. Like you gotta be cool with that. Like that roller coaster, you gotta be riding that adaptive. Number two is, uh, intelligent, but not just like on book smart, but like EQ. Like you need to understand how to like be good socially, but also know how to like be, be good in like topics that I can learn from. Like my girl is a skincare scientist. I'm, I'm learning a bunch of shit about like, you know, like <laughs> vitamin C serums or like, you know, BHAs. And she's telling me all that. I'm like, dude, I'm so fascinated about that, right? And number three is just generally like being like a very kind person. You know, you, it looks fade, but being like a kind person really sticks around and being a person that really understands. And I know this is just like the general bullshit you got here around, but like really, Finding someone that actually fits that bill, it's really hard. Do, no, go ahead. do you feel that humans are meant to be monogamous? Mm, at least for me, I, I am. Um, do I think other people are, are down for it? I definitely see some, some people are better. Um, Polly? Why, why are you pounding them? I'm down with that. Yeah. You're down with that? You don't act like that? Nah, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm, Damn, single. I'm single. What do you mean? Exposed? He straight stra tries to roast me I about roast this him. like every time. And I'm just yeah, like, yeah, 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 bro, yeah, if, I, if, I, if I had a girlfriend, like I, I, would, I would, but, yeah, but I don't. Imagine piping 100 girls you can't find a girlfriend. You're the problem. Nah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I found girlfriends. Wait, wait. So, so do you believe that humans are meant to be monogamous? For me, yes. 
Yeah. He know he thinks he's meant to be monogamous. Yeah. I, I can't speak for humans. Yeah. yeah. That's well, a no, lot well, of people. Well, so so I mean I mean yeah you're right. Well so my well through some research at the end of the day I I truly believe like there's a certain level where a human gets to where it doesn't necessarily matter anymore. What do you like, mean? High net worth individuals are all have outside relationship. They they they. But you can't they, you no, can't no, say all. You can't say all. They 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 all. No, you can't say. I all. can say okay. Ninety percent. Okay, a high percentage. A yes. high. Okay, okay, cool. <clears throat> yeah, fair, fair. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Appreciate that. The first thing you said correct all night. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just said that. To you. I, 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 yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Night, a high percentage to me, 85%, 90% at a certain point, the dynamics of a relationship isn't solely based on sex. It's based on other things, right? Like, do you take care of me? Are you a good person to our children? Are you the right partner to raise them? All right, go do whatever you want. Don't bring it in the house. That's just how I feel. And it could go both ways. It doesn't have to be male, female. It could be female, male, whatever it is. I mean, I've, we've, we've spoken about this topic before, and I've said how I feel. But, you know, and marriage is a failing thing in the U.S. It is, or, I think marriage is a failing thing in the U.S. because of a sentiment like this. Ah, no, not necessarily. And really, really, when you really look at also cultural relationships, it's very archaic in other countries. You know, what's a hill that I'll Women die can't on? vote. Women can't drive. Women can't, like, you know what I'm saying? There, there's a hill that I'll die on. People that go through whole faces are more loyal people. I would die on that hill. Facts. You know why? People that go through whole faces obviously are sleeping around for that period of time. And they know what they can get. They've seen all the options. So when they get into a relationship, they're like, yeah, I've been through that, done that. I, I'm not peeking around because I ultimately found that person that caught my interest after that sleeping around. That defeated the whole thing. The phase. people that are like snooping around, if you look at uh, around the people that are like, you know, eyeing around when they're in a relationship or a marriage, are the people that never really got that many when they're single. So they're like, oh, I could have done that. Or I could, I like, you know, mm. that, that's probably better than what I had. They settled. They settled. But people that went through whole faces didn't settle. They picked out of so many more options. And it was the right option. Mm. That's my theory. The same point I brought, brought up last time. See Jason's point on it. Any like, there's a lot of things that humans are naturally inclined towards, and I feel like, and I think, and I believe this wholeheartedly, that the human's ability to restrain themselves from their natural inclinations is one of the things that makes humans humans. And beyond just being human, being like a stellar human. Same thing with with, what Tim said about that point, being like, yeah, if you just ate everything that tasted good, right, like you would die fast, right? And sex is one of those things like, yes, there's STDs and scary things like that. But overall, you, you could have as much sex as you want with as many partners as you want. And realistically, like your beliefs aside, you wouldn't feel too different. But there's always like, like nature has kind of shown us that resisting like the temptation of life is kind of rewarding like in the long run you know what i'm saying and i feel that way as somebody who's definitely you know delved the other way and i feel that way because like you know i feel like the like no matter how much i'm like oh man 15 year old me would be proud as fuck right now but i'm like nah low-key i i I wish like you know i'm saying like i didn't do this you know i'm saying and then now i'm in a cycle of like fuck i can't help it and like you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And, and even though, and that's my natural inclination, you know? I think that just people need to touch the stove that's hot. I think everything's on a spectrum as well. Um, what do you think about that, Jason? I mean, there's no, like, universal rule that we can make on this podcast for saying if someone should be X and Y. Mm-hmm. There's so many variables that involve culture, you know, their upbringing and, you yeah. know, who they're around. I can only speak for myself. I'm not going to be like, this is the rule of law. This is what you got to do. For me, I'm going to stay monogamous because I believe that I can find someone that can really meet all my needs. But there are definitely people out there, depending on their status, depending on their lifestyle, that needs to be poly. All power to them. I'm not going to control how you live. Mm. Right? There's always going to be really good arguments for one way or another. I'm not going to be here to be, you know, the chair to dictate what people do with their dick. Mm-hmm. Right? But there is... Dictate. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but there's definitely fundamentally a difference for how men approaching to how women approaching because the liability is def- definitely different, right? For women, if you fuck up, you're stuck for the next nine months. For men, you can be going around, going around town for as long as you want. 
So the, the, the liability is technically a lot less for you, you know, without going to the legal bullshit, right? So for me personally, I, I think that I can find someone that I like and be around for the rest of my life. That's how I'm going to do it. Whatever you do for your life, go for it. I'm not mm. going to judge you for it. The for life thing is also crazy to me because people just fucking change. Who I was six months ago, a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, just a different person. I can understand why people liked me or didn't like me then and who I am now. So, Fire. I think we should wrap it up with that. Yeah. That was a good ending conversation. I drank. Finished. I'm Jason Wong, and I am under the influence. Wow. You really got all the way to the end. I really like that you did that. But since you're here, might as well like and subscribe and leave a comment on who's got the nicer hair. We're also giving away $50 every week to the funniest review of our podcast. All you got to do is leave a review that'll make us giggle, screenshot it, and then text the number on the screen, and you're automatically entered for a chance to win. Also, that's a real number, so you can just text us when you're lonely, you need a date to prom, or if you're looking for hot single moms in your area, text us. I'm Utak. I'm Jeremy. And, and we're, we're Under the Influence. influence. Ahaha. Ah. Ah.